Hello, it's Jack Tudor here of Attention Magazine. Welcome to Crucial Listening, the podcast where I speak with musicians and sound artists about three albums that are important to them. My guest this time is Annie Aries, a Swiss Philippine composer and musician based in Bern, Switzerland. Annie's debut solo album, It's Not Quiet in the Void, came out earlier this year on Everest Records. It's a super record I've been having a great time with it and one thing I've really been compelled by with this is that a lot of these pieces have the sense of being drone music and yet you know the stasis of this music or at least the slow movement only really manifests if you give it a cursory listen if you go like one layer down there is so many collisions and ripples and squirms going on under the surface and he uses a custom-made modular synthesizer system which clearly is channeling so much complexity into this music and we talk about the title of this record uh, originating from I guess you could say like a geological phenomena but basically boils down to this idea that there is cases where so much energy and power is being exerted undetected either because of the time scale over which it's occurring or just how it slips under our sensory capabilities and there's so much of that in this work and what I love as well is what becomes clear from this conversation is Annie is a real explorer someone who's clearly self-interrogating a lot and looking to kind of change and adapt and you know each of these pieces seems to contain a kernel of that self-reflective spirit as well uh talking to annie was great like she's clearly someone who thinks a lot about music and you know articulates her relationship with it beautifully three wonderful records that we talked about here as well i love the charlemagne one in particular holy moly uh This was great. I hope you like it too. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please do consider supporting it. You can throw over a few pounds over at Coffee, either one off or monthly. That's ko fi.com forward slash crucial listening. There's a link in the show notes. And you can, like I say, do that one off or as a monthly subscription. But thank you. Uh, Okay. Here we go then. This is Annie Aries on Crucial Listening. Hello, Annie. Welcome to Crucial Listening. Hi, Jack. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming on the podcast. So you're here to talk about three important albums. Before we get to those, I want to ask about your solo album, It's Not Quite in the Void, released on Swiss label Everest Records. So I've been having a wonderful time with this one. Uh, I've heard a little bit about your modular system I've heard you talk about it on a separate podcast but I wanted to start by asking uh, what did making this album look like for you so when you think back to kind of memories of making this album like what kind of environments come forth most prominently like what time of day what does making this album look like oh wow what an amazing question (laughs) um well, of course, it was a very emotional journey, I would say. Yeah, settings, setups uh, changed a lot. I tried also to to blend in some 
older sounds like field recordings I collected over the years. Yeah, and try to, to process them. And then the setup, the modular synth setup kept changing. Uh, also mm. because I was playing concerts, um, I had the opportunities to, to play actual music. And then I realized, hmm, this module would be great in terms of this sounds. And yeah, so there was a lot of change, I think, in terms of the instrument. And then, yeah, when I had like the final go, from from the label Everest Records, it was it was like clear like clearly now you have to make your final decision <laughs> how you how you want to keep your setup and then just go for it. So so yeah, that was that was quite an intense journey because it's also like my first solo project. I've never did something similar like like that. Yeah. So so yeah, it was very emotional. It was intense. It was beautiful, but also very. Um, I was also like scared, of course, uh, in terms of decision making. Yeah, so hmm, I think that <laughs> summarizes <laughs> a little bit like the whole emotional journey, of course, attached yeah. to, to the album. Yeah. Yeah. And when you settled on your setup, uh, yeah. was that a setup that you felt, right, okay, this is one where I know to some extent at least the sort of parameters or the you know the horizon the possibilities and i you know i feel like i can i can work with this like this mm -hmm. this i'm happy to kind of you know solidify into a record right yeah 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 so of course i had some like crucial or major goals that i was striving for like i wanted to play drones for at least half an hour 40 minutes so i just got the modules needed in in, in doing so so that mm. was like that was set like fixed and then after after a while realizing oh it would be great to to create more overtones or or more filtering yeah it was just, just something in terms of sounds that i was trying to go for that made it way easier to mm. to make the final decision of course yeah uh i really struck on this record by the choices you made with regards to track duration this is a really mm. fascinating thing for me because i think obviously with drone the immediate surface level assumption that we make is that it's a music that is primarily static that's kind of mm -hmm. how we readily associate it and yet your drones are anything but and it's amazing how you can have a <laughs> track that's say five minutes long right. or in that region and the movement is just constant there are there are changes happening all the time all and yet the time. you have yeah. this sense of continuity and continuum which allows us to perceive it as a as a drone and the duration you don't feel short changed i think there's so many cases where you get a drone, drone record and you know or, or something in this vicinity and after six minutes you're just like well what next <laughs> i need right, more but right. you the the way your record wields i think duration and uses those short tracks is fascinating so I wanted to ask you about that. What led to your decision to opt for shorter track durations here? Thank you so much, Jack, for saying that. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, in terms of drones, you're obvious. Yeah, you, you're totally right. Uh, I think for a drone album, it's too short <laughs> because it's only, <laughs> it's only 40 minutes. But yeah, but there's always uh, continuously change in, in in the sounds. And I think that was like my main main focus, my main goal, like the 40 minutes duration, because I desperately, I wanted to release on vinyl. That was like... Right, yes. Yeah, that was something I really wanted to do because I, I really like the material or, you know, like having something in your hands if you if you listen to, to music. So I knew like, okay, everything I wanted to do artistically or musical approach wise has to fit in 40 minutes. Mm. <laughs> so what I really wanted to do is because it was a live set first, I wanted to record the live set experience on, on, on the vinyl oh, or on right. a recording. And of course I realized after a while that some parts have a powerful impact on stage even more than than on the on the record, mm. um, but I think it was a it was an okay compromise for me because the main goal for me or what I was striving for was to record a live set 
or something I was very, very familiar to perform with. And hopefully that comes a little bit, or that makes it some way audible if you hear the record that it also, or comes from a live context even yeah. more. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, one track I wanted to ask about specifically is called Commute because Oh yeah. To begin with, within the opening seconds, you know, it feels like you're listening to a train pulling in, you hear the squeak of the brakes, you hear a mm -hmm. lot of the kind of hydraulics, I guess it would be. Don't know much about train engineering. But then it, <laughs> it carries <laughs> <laughs> But then it when it continues and you continue to hear the brakes and you hear these sounds, I mean I'm like, how long is this train? There's something very surreal about it where I, I, I'm like, have you edited that? Is this are these sounds being extended? Is it a train at all? It's amazing how often this question comes up on this podcast where people are presenting field recordings that mm. I feel like a <laughs> almost like uh, there's something surreal about them. That, right. You know. So yeah, can you tell me about that one? What What am I hearing? Yeah. Um, it It's not a train. <laughs> 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 um, so most of my field recordings um, I made in the past years are were on hikes. I really like to hike, and sometimes I bring my my recorder with me and just record crickets and and um, you know the noises on top of a mountain. <laughs> mm, yeah. Eventually, eventually, a, a, an airplane. Um, just crosses and probably probably it's plain sounds um, that that you hear, oh. um, and I think of course like the process that the sounds or the field recordings undergo are time stretch and spectral filtering. Ah, oh, right. So they are edited um, bef uh, before I let them in the system, like in the modular synth system. Um, and I play with, with time stretch first, and then the field recording has a different length and also a different pitch. And then mm. it undergoes another spectral filtering process in the system, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it does. That's amazing. Um, there's so much on this record about duration, which is, again, just seems to be something I keep coming back to. Mm -hmm. um, so you worked with, um, please tell me if this pronunciation is wrong, but Benoit Picand with yeah. mixing and mastering. Tell me about yeah. Benoit's involvement in this from mixing standpoint. Well, actually, the whole process. What was it like working with Benoit? Yeah, wonderful. Um, Benoit Picard is w used to be my my audio techniques teacher when I still was studying ah, cool. music and media arts at the art school in in Bern, and um, he just has a very good sense or an understanding for this kind of music. And for me, it was very clear to work with Benoit, as there is already like. The fundamental understanding of where I wanted to go. Mm. Yeah, he did the mixing, invited me to his studio, and let me mix the whole thing on his console. Oh wow! Which, yeah, which was which was so nice because it got another level of liveness again because I could change the dynamics and the volumes. Um, yeah. On, on his console in his studio. Mm. And then after that process, he he also blended some, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but also like additional filtering process to the sounds that, that we mix together. And in the end, he all recorded it on tape and ah. mixed it on tape. Wow. For the final vinyl. So it, yeah, it got some, uh, it got some, I, I would say more liveness with, with his uh, with his understanding and mm. with with his artistical view, I guess I guess, and then also the medium aspect of it got just a whole other level of what wow. I could have imagined it could have, you know. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's amazing. So, before we go on to your important records, Annie, is there anything else? No, no pressure. If there's not, if there's is is there anything else? that you kind of wanted to express about this record or that you feels, I don't know, key or interesting to understand this record? Um, yeah, before we move on. 
Oh, oh my God. Um, maybe there is. Um, I got very much inspired doing this album uh, because I was talking to to a close friend of mine who who is a geologist in South Africa, mm. and he he showed me some some images, some pictures he took from stones that are found in this specific area in Cape Town that came up to the surface, that come up to the surface after, I don't know how many, many million of years <laughs> due <laughs> a volcano uh, eruption. And the images are so, so beautiful and just so unique. And it's actually the cover of one of these stones that, that Martin, my friend, found in, um. in Cape Town. And that led me to to the title that it's not it's it's definitely not quiet in the void <laughs> <laughs> oh that's great even the yeah because the cover itself is loud uh, yeah which is and there's great. a lot of things happening <laughs> yeah it's so nice i bet that looks lush on the vinyl as well mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. uh well annie this record is great uh this is a very brief insight a few questions that you know i've asked here but i could ask dozens more it's such oh. a great record <laughs> thank uh, you so much I'd love for people to check it out so i'll put a link in the show notes so that they can do just that but um let's go to your important records now so there's one question i like to ask at this point which is how you thought about the word important when picking your list of three records so was there a way that you understood the word important in order to come up with the list that you did yeah it was um, quite a hard task for me. <laughs> <laughs> I could yeah. have just listed so, so many more. There's so many, for me, important albums that, of course, have to be mentioned. Um, but I, I narrowed them down. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> and And how I um, understood important or interpreted the, the word important, um, of course, is the emotional connection mm. to to the music or the inspirational impact that that it had the kind of musical approach that that struck me or inspired me and a little bit of artistic innovation probably as well like mm. techniques or technologies um, so that brought me to the three albums that we're going to talk great answer um great well we can go in any order you please i don't know if there's one that makes sense to you but if you could give me the name of your first important record and then a little bit about why it's important to you as well okay that sounds great um why don't we start with ellen radig yeah the trilogy de la mort uh yeah so to begin with yeah give me a brief introduction as to why this one's important to you Okay, um, I discovered Trilogy de la Mort by chance, and it was a time when I still was studying. Yeah, it just blew me away. It's a, I think it's just a masterpiece. Mm. And the fact that it's older, like, I think Radig released it in 92, or she was working on it from 88 to 92, something like that. Mm. And I still can remember how overwhelmed and astonished and simultaneously thrilled I was that <laughs> an album of such a duration was even possible, you know? I always thought, yeah, you know, like 40 minutes album length or <laughs> three, <laughs> four minutes uh, track length. I just was so, you know, blown away by the fact that Radig makes an album which is three hours long <laughs> yeah it's just amazing i just love that <laughs> <laughs> but of course it's also um pivotal to me not only because of its length but also because <laughs> all these sounds and the sounds aesthetics she she used the the arp 2500 one of a a, a vintage synth you could say mm -hmm. <laughs> it's such a beautiful instrument and and she plays it so gracefully and skillfully yeah it's just so impressive what Radik does and for me it's important it's an important album because i had to chant i had the chance to play an arc 2500 oh yeah so i was so so lucky uh, it was during the 
um, during the production of Debris with my friend Marcel Zayas. So I have a collaboration uh, with Marcel and he was still studying uh, at Brown University, University in, in Providence at the time. And the uni had one of those instruments. So I visited Marcel and playing the ARP was just an unforgettable experience oh, wow. <laughs> for me. So when I hear Trilogy de la Mort, it's it brings it just brings me back to Providence, to to Rhode Island and the work with Marcel and yeah, there's so many, as I said, like emotional connections attached. Yeah. Also because I, I, I if I hear the sound of, of an ARP two thousand five hundred, it's it's just so remarkable and the sounds are so significant. I'm curious to hear more about you playing the ARP because I mean the only I'm not so au fait with electronics. The the composer I associate with that instrument is Elian Radig. And mm. there's I, I'm sure there are other people using it, but that's my connection point. Yeah. So to be playing it, I guess with the knowledge that Elian was using that instrument as well must be really surreal. What what do you remember what you did with the ARP or what that experience was like playing it? Mm. So first when I saw the ARP I was so confused because there are, aren't any patch cables. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, so you have you have like um like that the grid where you just change um like small faders to whatever sounds that you want to connect. So that was already like um an approach that was so new to me. I it took me some time to just grasp the idea of playing such an instrument without any cables. Yeah. Um, and I remember that when Marcel and I were so happy that uh, like sound came out. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, oh yeah, we did it, it's noise. <laughs> now let's do something else. And then we patched, we patched the filter and it was like a, a slow but gradual process on learning uh, the instrument just by by yeah by by do by using it. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. What makes the album of Radik even more uh, special, you know, because you need this. To, you just need the skills to play mm. such such a, 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 an instrument like like the harp. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's got the kind of sound where. I suppose if you don't know about the process behind it, which exactly, or the difficulties yeah. of the instrument, it's it sounds like it could be something. Particularly now that we we have you know a real proliferation of of drone music, sounds like something that could have been improvised. And yet, I know that at least for a lot of our compositions, and I'm assuming it's the same with these, there are these meticulous charts where everything is plotted out, and these changes and transitions are methodically done, which is Mm. amazing to think mm -hmm. that firstly she's able to find a visual analogy to the kind of music she's working with but also that yeah there's this premeditation to you know the whole thing Crazy. yeah yeah totally so with trilogy de la Mort, where does your listening to this record tend to take place as you say it's a long record yeah. where do you tend to listen to it uh, basically in my home if i'm traveling or or in sitting in a train, I like to listen to music, but I realized after a while that um, I, I'm, all, I'm sometimes a little bit distracted and then I cannot mm. pay attention to, to the music anymore. So I, I like to take some time and listen to, to music, of course. Um, and I found like if I'm at, at home in my environment, then I feel I have the time to, or the dedication to listen to music like this but of course like three hours is is it's so long <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and i remember uh listening to the whole thing once in in my place under headphones and yeah it's also very physically it's a physical experience of course i cannot i couldn't do it all the time <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but like once in a while an excerpt or i just jump in and then listen maybe half an hour or yeah sometimes yeah. one hour yeah i love to do that it's very yeah as you said it's um it, it has an, a meditational aspect but you can also listen to a lot of um 
noisy artifacts and you just discover always some new sounds and that's what I especially like. Mm, yeah. And you mentioned when you discovered this record, I mean, the duration was one thing that hit you up from, um, you know, three hour album. That also is very exciting for, for me <laughs> as well when I found this album. Like, what was your frame of reference for discovering an album like this? Were you familiar with drone music up until this point? Or, you know, was this an induction mm -hmm. for you? Yeah, tell me about that. Maybe, I, maybe a little bit. I had a, I had a wonderful professor um, who introduced us or the whole class to a bunch of very interesting music. I'm not 100% sure if it was him or if I did some research after class and then just by chance stumbled over Elian Radik. Uh, but I have some I have a memory when I watched watched the the movie S Sisters with Transistors. Yeah. Elian Radik has um uh, well is portrayed as well. And it brought me just back to oh I know this artist. I just have to oh I just need to to listen to her music more profoundly. Um but it was already a name in my in my head that that I knew, but mm. not as 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 profound, of course, in terms of her musical releases or or compositions. And then I I I just fell into a rabbit hole yeah. <laughs> and and listened to a lot of her her stuff and even the electroacoustic music that or the, the compositions she wrote for traditional instruments are yeah are amazing. With, with the drone aspect and with the drone um, approach attached. It's just, Erlian Rudik does a lot of things right in my eyes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think the acoustic stuff's fascinating because it kind of makes clear that her music, I mean, she worked with tape as well, right? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe prior to the ARP, but there's something about her music which is separate from the materials used to make it so it's not music for the art it's just that happens to be the medium for this very singular conception of exactly movement yeah. and yeah uh are there other records you could have picked for this you mentioned you went into a rabbit hole i think everyone does right when they discover elian's music it's like oh my gosh i need all of this are there were there other releases in the mix for you for picking as the important one? Oh. Probably the, I'm, I hope I'm spelling that right. The o o o some o ocean. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The one with with the the, the orchestra. Like, it's not a big orchestra, but uh, the traditional instruments performing this 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 work was mm. also something I almost would have picked. <laughs> yeah, just because just because the approach of drone put into traditional instruments is is something I, I always enjoy, also in a live context. Have you seen her music performed live? No, never, unfortunately not. There were some students uh, in my school who were, were working with Radik's assistant on a, on a piece, which was actually o, Osam Ocean Number no. 2. Wow. So they were working um, closely with Elian and Radik as well, they went there. So I think that was like a wonderful experience for, for, for the students as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I saw, I just saw that or yeah, had, had my Elian moment. <laughs> 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 but oh, I, I don't think she will ever perform or go on stage again because I think she's born when was she born? In, oh gosh. In the four yeah. in the forties or something? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely the case that if there are any live performances of her music, it's interpretations by other musicians, right? Which is Yeah. Yeah. I'm I think she's over ninety ninety years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. So, I mean, fair enough. You don't have to perform. No, yeah, exactly. We'll give her a pass. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and how often do you listen to this record now? Oh, not that much anymore. Mm. Um, well, I listened to it preparing for the podcast, of course. And I had some, I had some nice moments. Yeah. <laughs> like, I definitely hear some 
some parallels with my album, yeah. which I like, which I really, really like. And, you know, like the long drones, the overtones. And that makes me proud and, and, and also very happy because I, I can still see myself as a younger person who, who was so unsure, you know, and, and so uncertain if she could ever find her musical path <laughs> and, and, and listening, yeah, just like listening to, to the album uh, Trilogie de la Mort, like a couple days ago, uh, I, I, it, it felt nice, yeah. Annie, let's go to your second important album. Uh, so, which one do you want to go for next? Let's go with Charmant Palestine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, Jamaica, Heineken's in Brooklyn. So, again, if you could give me a little introduction as to why this one's important to you, that would be great. Yeah. So, also, I think this album was introduced in class from my professor. Wow. And, yeah. And I was, yeah, as well, instantly just mind blown. There's so many layers of dedicated work <laughs> hidden, <Right>. you know? <laughs> yeah. And and what we hear as an end result is so powerful. And it's just a musical amalgam of, of sounds, but mm. so, so musical. I just love the balance of field recordings and drone it's just mm. it's very significant and remarkable i think for for the album and it's important for me because at this time when i was studying for me how i let's say produced music was with field recordings this was something i just learned easily and it kept my attention for so many years and when I heard um, Jamaica Heineken's in, in Brooklyn, I wasn't sure at all or aware of what you're able to do with field recordings. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was just so, oh my God, this person does something so remarkable and so musical and, and, and with the field recordings, it gets... It, it, it's so um, momentary, yeah. as every field recording is, of course, but it's so, so special because um, there's so many voices and laughter and there's so much things happening. Yeah, it's, it's very unique, I think. And that's why I, I, I would say it's, it's so important. Yeah. Um, so the center of the re recording, the field recording, at the base of this is the um, Jamaica Day Parade, 5th of September, 1997, on Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe you've answered this question. I heard you talk a, on a different podcast about referencing this record as being important to you, and you mentioned mm -hmm. the fact that you wanted to do a record, a solo album at some point. This, this pushed you to want to do a solo album that, in some respect, Mm -hmm. was like this and what what are the qualities of this record that you think you wanted to carry over into <laughs> something that you wanted to do yeah, that's also a very great question um maybe to add something i forgot to mention mm. i heard this this piece or this album and i instantly knew that i wanted to do something like that Wow. That was just like, I just want the ability and, and capacity to do something like, and the skill to do this kind of music that mm. Shalman Palestine um, did. So that was so, that, 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 I think that was the biggest inspiration I've ever learned from music to my musical vision that 
yeah, it never <laughs> happened to me again. So this, wow, this, wow. yeah, yeah, totally. And to answer your question, when I learned that Jalman Palestine attended uh, the parade with um, with a ghetto blaster, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with an electronic drone that he pre-recorded um, with different kind of instruments, like I think he was using even the surge uh, synth and some some ARP synths and bandpass filter to produce the drone. So that was pre-recorded. And then he just packed his backpack with, <laughs> with the ghetto blaster, <laughs> attended the parade and just blended in that drone sound and recorded the whole thing. When I learned about that, I told myself, like, probably you won't do that. <laughs> 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 this is just so Shalman Palestine. I oh, think yeah. he's a, I think, I think he's a fun person. Yeah. You can yeah, tell, yeah. you you can tell, um, if you just Google him up, you just can tell, yeah. oh my God, <laughs> he must be fun yeah. and, and interesting to talk with. Um, and he also, I think he has a lot of fun um, doing what he's doing. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, I was sure I won't be. I'm never going to be able to be a person <laughs> like this. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but, but the sounds, you know, that he captures and he brings to, to our attention. Um, so it's so significant, I think. Mm. Um, I think I was so driven and inspired to find the field recording that comes close to, to what he captured. And it's, of course, it's very, <laughs> it's probably a little bit of an illusion um, <laughs> to find a parade that people attend and, and in Brooklyn and, and there's a lot of chats and, and laughter. Of course, it's an, it's an illusion, but it's somehow, I somehow, uh, um, made it to my goal that I would find some, some sounds out there in the world that come even close to, to what Shalman Palestine wow. recorded. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. When you go out field recording, um, tell me about your, your setup and what going out, you know, exploring for field recordings mm. looks like for you. So I have different microphones, um, I attach them to a Zoom recorder. Mm. I have a hyd hydrophone for water uh, or like creeks sounds that I want to capture. Nice. Um, I also have, uh, what is it called? The microphone, a contact microphone, sorry. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I nice. also have a contact <laughs> microphone. <laughs> I bring with, I attach it sometimes on stones and yeah do things on stones and stuff like that. But mostly uh, I just put the Zoom recorder on, on the ground and then just record the crickets or the birds or cows <laughs> mm, nice. yeah. that cross and, and just stay there for a while. And, and then, yeah, just, just move on to another mm. place, which I think are, there are exciting sounds to, to record. Wicked. Uh, and to return to you discovering this album originally, so Professor brought it up in class. So I, I'm curious to hear what came out of that class. Did you have did you have a discussion about the record or uh, yeah? What were the discussions like in relation to this album? I can remember that not everyone in class was so struck by it, which ah. made me even more upset. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like like yeah, there were different feelings. Some of them were like, yeah, it's nice. It's nice, cool. It's a nice idea. And I was like, what? No, this is so good. It's so good. It's the best thing you ever, you will ever hear. <laughs> so that was, yeah, that was fun. And of course I have, um, I had a best friend in class and we would just share the, the, the same feelings and, and hype each other up like, yeah, did you hear, did you hear oh, the, the helicopter yeah. sounds? Oh my God, no, I didn't. I have to go back and hear it again. And, and sometimes we just listen to it and, and have a, yeah, and just have a great time. Oh, having because a they're, buddy to listen yeah, to. That, oh, that's amazing. That, mm -hmm, that's really cool. I just have a friend who, who is very open 
well, we studied together, of course. She's very open to sound <laughs> arts, and and still sometimes she just sends me music that that she likes, and I send her back something eventually. And if we meet again, we just chat. Oh yeah, that was really a nice record, and yeah, and stuff like that. And then she's a she's a sound engineer. She would say, "Oh, I just mix them live," <laughs> you know, oh, that's like amazing. oh yeah, that's really cool. Wow. And I, I I just envy her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I was reading about this record, and I may be totally wrong. So apologies if if this is you know flawed info. So I understand he he wanted to do the Ghetto Blaster thing, and then wasn't able to get it right, and so ended up like superimposing the drone on top of the field recording, like after the the fact, which I I found fascinating because I was like, there's something so. It's funny when you talk about Charlemagne's character. And it seems like such a, as you say, a Charlemagne move to mm. be like just plowing through this parade, like yeah. get O Blaster, like that definitely aligns with the character. But then there's like a social energy to that where you can't capture something without knowing that you were in some of like sense impacting upon that social scene. You know, you're you're mm. kind of in amongst it, making a noise and then capturing people even subconsciously i guess must be responding to the fact that you're there playing these obnoxious yeah Um, yeah yeah, when it's superimposed like after it's like so there's this really strange displacement where the sounds coexist on the recording but like not within the situation it kind Mm. of almost feels to me like it felt like tinnitus at that point where it's just like it's a sound that you receive as a listener but is a sort of private um overlay to yeah. the the recording right which um yeah i thought was like a, a lovely quality of this record where kind of like a different version of um what he was after yeah yeah it's I, I, yeah it's very interesting do you know um do you know max newhouse the pieces of of the artist who I... did some installation works I know the name, but um, I don't know the pieces. No. Yeah, so we have one. We have one of his pieces in Bern, where I live and work, and it's a bridge that just plays drones and sounds. Ha! Huh. Wow. And it's just a bridge, uh, and uh, on the left and right, it's a school and some people living in apartments. There's houses. There's a park, a small one where people just hang out. And if you just cross the bridge, you're just fully emerged. Uh, immersed um, in in drones in drone sounds. Wow! So that's that's so pretty because it blends in it blends in with the sounds the sound environment that's already given. And as far as I remember, uh, Max Newhouse recorded the sounds from there and then processed it to drones, probably similar to what Shalman Palestine did with filtering, um, with some modulations ongoing and put it back on the bridge. It has this whole very organic sounds that are just differently processed, you know? Something, sometimes you hear something from afar, maybe some laughter or children playing on the playground, and then you have this almost exact pitch sound hmm. on, on, on the bridge that blends in so well, and it, it's, a very nice, it's a very nice work. And sometimes I think... When I'm on the bridge, sometimes I think of Stalin Palestine. It's a way more radical way what what he did. Yeah. Almost like a little bit of an alien move to put sounds into an environment that doesn't belong there. Yeah. And probably that that's the the, the I would say like the musical handwrite handwriting of of this artist to make it so musical that it fits, that it works well, that this, the drones blend into the helicopter sounds. <laughs> and, and it makes me giggle, it makes me laugh. And, and it's um, probably also from, compared to my musical visions I have, it's always something, well, I like to say myself, push some boundaries or, you know, play the drone some minutes longer and wait and see what it does with the audience and stuff like that. Maybe I just want to see that, but I, I would say that Shaman Palestine pushes 
a lot of boundaries. <laughs> 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 yeah. Imagine just like him wearing a backpack and and a ghetto blaster in that oh my God. cheering crowd, and he would be like, "Oh, I'm just a sound uh, scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Don't yeah. mind me." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, well, because he often had as well. I saw him uh, perform a collaboration with Oren Umbachi, and he had this suitcase oh, really? open of soft plush toys that it was oh just facing oh my god the, the stuffed toys yeah. yeah so again the thought of someone with you know plush toys falling out of their backpack in the middle of this yeah. parade being like i'm a sound engineer just like i've got this covered don't worry yeah. but i'm a pro <laughs> professional uh, <laughs> he's yeah. a great spirit i love that yeah i saw shaman palestine in berlin um but he was performing schling schlingen bang blangen the organ, the organ piece. Yeah, and that also was very site specific, I would say, because, you know, the, the whole environment, the whole place and the organ, of course. And yeah, it was an amazing concert, very long, but beautiful. The sounds beautifully immersed and evolved. Really, really nice. And oh. then he put some stuff toys on, <laughs> on the <laughs> side and and he was like, "Oh yeah, they're so important to me. I have to put them here, <laughs> just like you said. Don't, don't, don't mind, don't mind me. I got yeah. this covered. Just, I have to fix something." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. So I think I think Shalom Palestine must be someone fun to hang out with. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So Annie, is there anything else you wanted to say about this album before we move on to your final record? Mm. Maybe I have a question for you now here. Uh, it, I just wonder how you felt when you listened to it for the first time. I adore this record. Uh, I've only heard Charlemagne in, in the context of strumming music, but that was a long time ago. And mm. um, that collaboration I referenced with Oren, which was absolutely crazy. Like he was, I'm pretty sure he was pretty drunk. Um, and just kind of yelling for most of it, but you know, oh, so I, <laughs> uh, he's a big energy, and um, this record has something quite gentle about it, and almost um, you're listening patiently over like an unbroken period of seventy minutes to the mm. unfolding of this parade, and I I think everything you said about the field recording, I agree with where there's so much going on and it's so dynamic and I guess that's the beauty of a parade is that the you use, use the word momentary and that's exactly it like you just feel like so much is possible within that stereo frame and the drone is so interesting because the field recording by itself would have been fascinating and yet there is something so I can't even put my finger on it, but when that drone is overlain, there's a strange serenity. There's mm. almost like a listening mood which descends upon the recording that um, feels like you're kind of listening through Charlemagne's ears rather mm. than mm -hmm. your own. There's like, he's very much a kind of midpoint between you and that parade. And yeah, there's something very just surreal that happens because mm. obviously the Jamaica Day Parade sounds, you know, obviously I can imagine being at that event, it would be so vibrant. And obviously there's such a um, vivid like culture going on within that parade. And yet something about the drone augments it. Uh, yeah. Like I adore this album. I've listened to it a few times since you... Uh, put it in your list I'd not heard it before now so very grateful to you for uh, flagging this <laughs> one for me wow we would have get along very well in class <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah I'd be there as well being like yes yeah. I heard that helicopter yeah. I loved cool. it as well yeah <laughs> cool nice <laughs> uh.
Hani, we've got one more important record. Again, if you could give me the name of it and then a little bit about why it's important to you as well. Right. Okay. So I brought Holly Herden's Proto with me on my list. Um, also, a friend, a working colleague, introduced me to the artist. And um, I was instantly just inspired by the piece Home. That was, oh, that was maybe 10 years ago that came out. And I just love the aesthetics. Even the, the music video is, 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 is quite impressive. And it was fun and, and new and, yeah, also very uh, mind-blowing for me. And after a while, I learned that an article in a newspaper uh, came out and brought to my attention that she released Proto. I read the article and I, was, I just was so struck. AI is not a field of my expertise at all. So I was just very amazed by what Holly Herndon was able to do with AI. And it's just, I think it's just a masterpiece. So yeah, of course, like as AI was very new to me and I couldn't even grasp um, or like put my head around AI, it was just so far, far away uh, in terms of musical approach. Um, what was interesting in my music, you know. So when listening to Proto, it just completely took away my skepsis towards AI. <laughs> right, wow. So I think Proto is a wonderful example for, for me that AI is, is powerful, a powerful musical tool. And it also showed me that it's certainly possible to create something very profound and, and inspiring than such as Holly Herden did. And yeah, that's why I think the album is, is so important. Yeah. Do you have any favorite tracks on the album? I do. Um, I really like Godmother. Ah, huh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's so short, but it's a lot of density and a lot of, um, yeah, sounds evolving, happening. And the beats, the sounds, they're so remarkable, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it just shows me how with so little, like clicks and cuts, it's just <laughs> <laughs> feasible to do something so impactful. Yeah, yeah. only if it's two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and of course, I also like um, first one, I think it's called Birth. Mm. And, and sometimes if I have some gigs where I DJ, I play Birth. <laughs> Really? Just to start, yeah, just to start the set, and I can tell you, it catches a lot of attention. <laughs> I really, <laughs> I really, really like that. <laughs> That's so interesting, yeah, because that, as I understand, is sort of captured in the early stages of them developing this AI system spawn, mm -hmm. and so it's just like finding its feet and coming up with garbled stuff. That's amazing. You use it to kick off your uh, DJ set. I can imagine that one being a real head turner. <laughs> yeah. As you mentioned, this is a work which, I mean, certainly I'm not involved in technology and, you know, in the sense that I'm not hugely au fait with AI. I kind of try and mm -hmm. keep a, a finger in just to kind of understand how things are developing, particularly at the moment. But certainly at the time that this record came out, it felt incredibly novel that you know holly was was doing this i'm sure people in certain circles would be like oh yeah this was you know coming for for, for a long time but certainly it was like okay this is very striking yeah um i agree yeah what what has your relationship been like uh with i don't know music and ai since like have you followed that at all like has this led you this record into exploring it any further or yeah <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. I think I think a lot of musicians are wrapping their heads around AI. I would say, as mentioned, that I'm not a skeptic anymore and afraid of the change of technology probably or AI in specific anymore as much as I was when when I was younger or when I still was studying. I'm curious. I'm just very curious. It could be that at some point I could dive in more 
into into AI because I mm. think in terms of algorithmic or generative music, I'm already very interested. And I have a I have a patch I play on stage which is uh, generative, and I enjoy to play with random, uh, like random pan patterns specifically or random beat changes. Um, it gives a lot of uh, or a different lifeness into 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 the set, as I, and as I have pre-patched presets, uh, I can blend in, which are prepared in my in in my performance. One is completely random in terms of uh, in terms of the the sequence, wow. the step sequence. So I sometimes don't know what will happen, <laughs> <That's really cool. laughs> and I just like the aspect of interaction or human performer, you know, on stage and technology that, of course, is fundamental um, in the performance, but then the result is, yeah, is dedicated or dedicated to the music or musical. So I think I could see myself in the future maybe working with, with AI as long as it stays uh, or as long as a human performer stays in 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 the focus, yeah. And probably that's why I also like Proto that much because I think Holly Herndon puts the performer very much into foreground. Mm hmm. Yeah. I I think this is seems to be a key thing with Proto. Like I have a, I, I bought the record when it came out and have a kind of fraught relationship. I think with the record, but as an extension of that relationship with AI where I agree the fact that AI is used as kind of part of I think she refers to it as being like just one voice in the choir mm. on this album rather than like the primary um, process by which the record is is made so there's this yeah it feels like there's there's a statement in there around ensuring that the person wielding the AI has yeah. creative uh, intentions and kind of like is is mindful with the intentions of it which i think is seems to be this is a, a huge thing with ai at the moment around trying to get ahead around the dangers and, and pitfalls it's like well so much of that relates to the fact that it's these huge corporations which are leading the yeah. show in terms of um what ai may be capable of and you right. know if the corporation has nefarious intent then guess what the ai is going to be <laughs> wielded in alignment with some pretty icky stuff but this like the thing with i think holly's record that made me always uncomfortable was the fact that she referred to it as a baby, baby. and i was like yes. oh it made me feel icky but uh, yeah i know i know <laughs> I, it, <laughs> I can remember i can remember reading the the article in the newspaper and um i think her partner and her were working a lot on on the algorithm and the programming and then they always yeah. referred as our baby yes <laughs> Born yeah. our baby <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah it, cut, it catches a lot of attention I, I i understand it's it's fun well it's just not where i want to go <laughs> probably <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun i think it's yeah oh, it yeah. makes me very it makes me very curious yeah yeah, it's it's great in the sense that I think it posits a more nuanced engagement with the topic rather than just like, let's abstain from thinking about AI because it just feels very gloomy and dark and awful. Yeah. And yeah. not just like a, neither is it like a wholesale adoption of AI as the future. It's sort of pitching itself in that gloopy, strange sensitive area in the in the middle yeah. you know somewhere yeah i just recently bought a book i think it came out some years ago but it's poetry from ai oh wow <laughs> yeah it's very i mean i agree i totally agree with you when you say like the gloomy aspects and the maybe darker yeah ai paths that that may open with the technology, I, I just found this book because I was listening to a podcast a couple of weeks ago, and it made me very curious. Like, oh, poetry from AI that must yeah. be that must be great. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, it is fun, it is fun, it is fun to read. And I think I resonate a lot with 
let's say in a global sense, like technology, that the outcome of it is touching and, you know, like emotionally, like inspiring and, and mm. beautiful, you know, then I'm, then I'm just super curious to, to learn about it even more where probably take us from here, you know, if mm. AI is possible to write some beautiful poetry, what does that mean for the human? <laughs> yeah, right. You're right. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. What's, what's the kind of tone of it? Is it oh, abstract it's... or... Oh, it's very, uh, yeah, it, not, not that much abstract. It's very soft, I would say. It's very soft, very, the, the language, very distinguished and, and nice, you know, as if you would read some heartbroken mind behind the lines. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, or like a super, a super experienced person in terms of, yeah, emotions and, heartbrokenness <laughs> mm, wow that's yeah, super crazy. cute <laughs> <laughs> i think this is the thing is um yeah when you mentioned about the implications to the human performer like i obviously love having conversations like this and it's like i always want to be able to chat to someone about their relationship with you know why they do what they do mm. and uh it seems like that there's been this existential question posed recently around, you know, these AI music generation apps where people yeah. are like, oh gosh, what's going to happen to human performance? But um, I like music emanating from people. <laughs> where, Fair enough. You know, like, <laughs> you know uh, I, I think that's the lovely thing about Proto where it's like um, some of those tracks are gorgeous and they're gorgeous because mm -hmm. I think it feels like Holly and, you know, I don't know what Matt's involvement was, but they were very much driving it and the AI was just in service to this beautiful thing. Right, yeah. Yeah. So where else have you gone in terms of Holly's music? So you mentioned Home as well. That does have mm -hmm. a very, very cool video. Uh, are there other records of Holly's as well that speak to you too? Well, the one with Home was, at, yeah, like nine years ago, 10 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, that... Um, was that a platform? Holly platform, yeah. And there's like also the the first track on on platform. I I, I really like the interference. It speaks for itself. <laughs> if you just <laughs> listen, if you just read the title and you listen to the piece, it's like okay, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> uh, and do you still listen to this record now? Not so much as I I wished. Yeah, it's just probably. Uh, tracks I, I I I spend some time listening to it as well. Mm. I mean, if I prepare a DJ set, then of course I I always <laughs> enjoy listen to Birth and Godmother, and then I also just just want to be sure that it comes to a specific very uh, fun moment or before another piece or after another piece that um, that catches a little bit the attention from the audience. Yeah, I think like this I I, I listen to the to the album or just parts of the album actively yeah <laughs> nice nice uh tell me a bit more about dj sets like what are there any, any other tracks at the moment that you're really enjoying incorporating into the dj sets that you're doing i don't dj that much like maybe let's say two or three times a year mm. and if i if i dj oh i always just wanted to check with the people who ask me to do that, if they're fine with electronic acoustic experimental music. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and if not, if just if they're like, yeah, we're pretty open, but then we just love to just rave, you know, <laughs> then I'm yeah. like, oh yeah, sure, of course. Then it's just Holly in the beginning and probably uh, Pierre Schaffer in the end. <laughs> 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 you know? <laughs> yeah, so that's that's pretty fun. I try. I remember I tried to blend in Gesang der Jünglinge from Stockhausen. Oh and, wow! Yeah, that was that was in, that was intense. <laughs> I'm not sure if I liked it that much, but but one was super, one moment was super fun because there was someone in the audience who used to be my professor as well, who was like, "Oh, this is Stockhausen." <laughs> <laughs> it just brought the whole DJ experience to another level you know <laughs> oh that is so amazing yeah that I was like fun you had one professor kind of whooping a yeah. among a crowd of <laughs> confused yeah, that ravers was, that was cute <laughs> that was really cute that's great um yeah i mean like the whole carly malone um 
lost law skill or like the whole room 40 people they're so nice too if you if i'm going for an ambient live set then it's super nice to to just bring these kind of musics oh, yeah. uh, on stage because they're so mesmerizing and they go well i don't know if that's a good or a bad thing but they go well in the background but also <laughs> Also, if people just want to pay attention to the music that is played, they're like, oh, wow, that's so that's so deep. Or mm. I could wrap my head around for hours and just lie down on the ground. So, yeah, these kind of DJ sets are rare. But if, if I get the occasion to do something like that, more experimental, then it's super fun. <laughs> There's one more thing I want to come back to, which you mentioned about you want to push your own boundaries, which you know I, I love, and you mentioned this generative. Uh, component of your setup as well which introduces randomness is that part of your efforts to push your boundaries or yeah tell me a bit more about what that looks like to push your boundaries Mm. within your music Mm -hmm. I mean of course if we come back to duration and length again Mm. then I'm sure this is this is a topic that I will face again or even more maybe if I wanted to work with in the future for a second album then I would have a whole different outlook on on length um but also since I played more and I had the chance to perform uh, even more than a year ago also like the life uh the life set aspect plays a crucial role if I think about length. I I see myself I see myself in the future maybe producing something only digitally, but maybe it's an hour long or two hours long. I I I, I kinda want to do that at some point. Maybe yeah, maybe not now, but maybe in the future at some point. So oh, I think this is something that I always question that yeah, like the vision of pushing boundaries. How far could I? How far could I go? How long is too long? You know, <laughs> for <laughs> <Yeah>. myself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I always yeah. get very uh, excited, or and also a little bit anxious about playing something for too long because you don't want to bore the audience. Or I, I still think a lot about the the receiver or someone who listens to the music. One part of me is still a little bit scared of not making music good enough, you know? Mm, There's always yeah. like this younger myself of being, my younger me is still insecure of doing the right thing and sometimes that, that comes up. Mm. And especially in terms of pushing boundaries, it's just like, am I pushing boundaries? Am I really pushing the boundaries? Is this a boundary? <laughs> Am I pulling? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but also, like uh, sound, sound wise, I think the pandemic was a catalyst for for me to start with the with the setup, and I spend a fair amount of time to expand the instrument with with modules. And the vision of the album was, of course, the goal to go, and there was. Yeah, that was the intention to have this kind of instrument. And now, yeah, I, I'm just thinking a lot about, okay, that's been done. And what else could we do in terms of sounds? And what sounds do I want to go more profoundly or just, you mm. know, spend my attention more more longer, which I, of course, could have been working a little bit longer uh, on, on the first record like the second the second side the b side of the vinyl has has so many field recordings and a lot of um processed sounds that sound sometimes a little bit messy in my in my head if i listen to the album 
yeah and and then it yeah i feel like okay that motivates that motivates um a part of me to to fix this you know like to right. or to pay my attention towards the b-side and do something with the sounds that sound a little bit messy to me now so i'm curious to put them uh to the process of sound like speed the time stretch and see mm. what outcome that um evolves or spectral sound processing i'm still yeah i'm still figuring out things right now and well, I'm probably speaking of boundaries, like emotional <laughs> boundaries or personal boundaries. It's something I like the feeling of being curious and and um, motivated, but also it scares me a little bit, you know. Hmm. It has both sides. So I think in terms of pushing my own boundaries, it's like, yeah, <laughs> I have to overcome these these feelings right now, which is also like a very crucial moment of probably being an artist you know yeah what a great answer oh my god um <laughs> Annie, i have one more question for you um which is about how you relate to music as a listener where do you tend to buy your music what kind mm. of formats do you prefer um yeah let me into that a little bit mm. yeah well i enjoy going to concerts and um, after a concert I tend to buy a cassette or a record that I can listen at home mm -hmm. um, I do that and it's also nice if you have the chance to talk to artists and get a recommendation like on their music what you may would like you know and and I think that's especially that's especially fun I just got a, a cassette from uh, Lauren Sarah Hayes. <laughs> oh, just met. gosh. Oh, I love that. I know. Oh, it was, yeah, it was very, it was a very nice moment. And she gave me a cassette of her live set. And she asked me like, oh, what kind of, I can recommend you something. What kind of music do you like to listen to? Did you like what you just hear? And I was like, yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we, we had, um, we had a gig together, uh, a month ago and that was nice to meet her in person oh yeah. brilliant yeah mm -hmm. Lauren's the best oh yeah so but I also have a Spotify account I don't use it very often um however I do listen to a podcast sometimes when I I'm doing housework <laughs> <laughs> nice nice so I love that but I also well I love Bandcamp I think mm. that's just a great platform to buy music and I like to buy music that supports the artists. Um, so Bandcamp is a is a nice platform in doing so. Um, I've also discovered so many great music uh, on Bandcamp. Yeah. So, so yeah, if I buy the music, I probably prepare a DJ set. You know, it goes hand hand in hand. If I perform or if I prepare DJ sets, I make sure that I bought sounds from Bandcamp and implement nice. them in my live set but I also listen to albums yeah while traveling I mentioned that right I just, that I cannot concentrate very yeah. well when when I'm on my on the road or like when when there's a lot of background music playing I I, I, prefer, I prefer to take some time to sit down and let myself be carried away by the music mm, yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> And yeah, Bandcamp is a great platform to do so because you just discover some great artists like constantly. They're yeah. so great recommendations and you just click on, on, yeah, you just click on Everest Records and then you just have a whole <laughs> bunch of recommendations and yeah, it's, it's a nice thing, I guess. Yeah, for sure. What I like about Bandcamp is that actually labels are still a thing where it's like, yeah, labels have Bandcamp pages. Um, mm. Whereas, you know, I use a streaming as well. It's like super useful for preparing for this podcast, for example. Mm -hmm. But labels are nowhere to be seen. Like maybe they're a little footnote at the bottom of the album, whereas Bandcamp still ensures that labels have some kind of role to play. And you're like, oh, okay, I like mm -hmm. this album on this label. I'm going to go and check out a bunch of the other releases, which is great. Yeah, totally. Mm. How do you like to listen to your music? 
Oh, great question. Uh, <laughs> very um, erratically, it happens everywhere. And uh, I feel like actually I need to introduce more silence into my life because I think the inclination is to just put music on constantly. I think as a byproduct of doing the podcast and um, uh, my reviews through Attention Magazine, like I have this itch where I want to be discovering or pushing myself into areas of music that I feel I haven't explored for myself mm. or to listen to an album again or so there's a kind of a compulsion to listen always which actually <laughs> isn't always healthy I, I think right. the absences <laughs> and the silences are where a lot of processing happens both in terms of music I'm listening to but also other <laughs> fundamental emotional stuff it's good yeah. to have those pockets where you're not being blasted by music but so I listen a lot um in the evenings in bed is a lovely place to listen mm. I like to listen in the car I do a long commute once a week for work and so I can fit like a long record into that commute which yeah is that's great decadent yeah it feels really good so there and then while I'm working as well because I work from home I listen to a lot of music obviously that is you know as you mentioned with listening while traveling it's a more indirect form of listening so it's mm -hmm. not ideal but nonetheless it's like nice place to put on some some records too so everywhere and everywhere mm -hmm. unless i put the stop on it because i need to for my own mental health so yeah, <laughs> yeah that's yeah, me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so great wow <laughs> oh well <laughs> annie thank you so much i mean i can't implore people to check out the record enough it is great uh and like i say please do check in the show notes your album is wonderful um these three records as well you picked three albums that really took my thinking in all kinds of directions and i love getting your insights on them too so <laughs> thank you so much it's been great thank you so much i had a lot of fun thank you so so much and to everyone listening see you next time goodbye